Chapter 2, Section 6, Congress, Effectiveness, Models of Political Representation. In a representative democracy like the United States, voters elect legislators to represent their interests rather than participate directly in the legislative process themselves. Three models of representation are commonly used to describe the different approaches that legislators may take regarding their roles as representatives of the people. In the trustee model of representation, voters choose a representative who is entrusted with the authority to use his or her own judgment. Under this model, representatives are justified in voting counter to the preferences or interests of their constituencies if they believe that doing so will promote the common good. In the delegate model of representation, representatives are obligated to vote according to the preferences of their constituencies. They have no authority to substitute their own judgment for that of the voters who elected them. The political model of representation is a hybrid theory that incorporates elements of both the trustee and delegate paradigms. The political model attempts to describe how elected representatives actually behave in practice. In this model, representatives will sometimes act as delegates, usually on issues that are especially important to their constituents, and sometimes act as trustees, often when their constituents lack an informed opinion on the matter. Assessing the effectiveness of individual representative or that of an entire legislative body like Congress often depends on which theory of representation is endorsed by the entity making the assessment. For example, a critic who advocates for the delegate model of representation would likely disapprove of a senator who routinely votes against the express interests of her constituents. But the same senator might be lauded for voting her conscience by a commentator who subscribes to the trustee model of representation. Political gridlock. To the extent that the effectiveness of Congress depends on its ability to pass laws and otherwise get things done, Political gridlock represents a failure of Congress to function effectively. The following situations represent common scenarios for political stalemates. Each House of Congress is controlled by a different party, and they are routinely unable to compromise. As a result, legislation that passes one House is often unable to pass in the other. The President is a member of a different party than the majority party of one or both Houses of Congress, causing their legislative priorities to conflict. This is especially likely to cause gridlock when the majority party in Congress lacks enough votes to override a presidential veto. Even when the House, the Senate, and the presidency are held by the same party, the minority party and the Senate can filibuster legislation favored by the majority party and prevent it from reaching the president's desk. One commonly cited explanation for the recent increase in partisanship is gerrymandering, the practice of drawing boundary lines for legislative districts so as to favor the party in charge of the redistricting process. Redistricting occurs in every state following the decennial federal census for one of two reasons. If a state gains or loses a House district due to changes in its population, it must redraw its electoral map to accommodate its new member of districts. Even if the number of its districts has not changed, a state must redraw the boundaries of its existing districts using updated census data so that each district is roughly equal in population. Article 1 of the Constitution grants each state legislature the power to determine how it will administer federal elections within its borders, including the redistricting process. Thus, the party that controls the legislature controls the redistricting process. And that party often uses its redistricting power to maximize the number of House seats it will control. As a result, fewer House districts are competitive in the general election, magnifying the significance of primary elections. Because the winner of the primary election is typically the one who appeals to the most passionate and ideologically entrenched voters, an increasing number of representatives in the House lack in electoral incentive to compromise, which in turn leads to an increase in the likelihood of political gridlock. The Supreme Court has placed some limits on redistricting. In Baker v. Carr, 1962, the court first affirmed its authority to review legislative redistricting for constitutional violations.
In that case, the court held that the state of Tennessee's failure to update its redistricting scheme for more than 60 years violated the implicit constitutional principle of one person, one vote, because, over time, the outdated boundaries had resulted in the overrepresentation of voters in rural districts compared to those in urban districts. Later, in Shaw v. Reno, the Supreme Court prohibited the practice of gerrymandering, that is, using race as a factor when drawing the boundary lines for legislative districts.